recorded at Get a Grip Studios in Toronto, Canada. A Get a Grip Management production and in association with the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Presented by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, the National Lighting Bureau, the Illuminating Engineering Society, and of course, the International Dark Sky Association. This is Starving for Darkness. I know you're hungry, folks. I know you're starving. Starving for Darkness with Jane Slade and Michael Colligan coming up real soon. But before we get into that, it's not always and every day that you come across something magical. That's right. I'm talking about Evluma, Greg Eric. Evluma, E-V-L-U-M-A dot com. Talk about a company who's committed to the darkness movement that we're pushing here with this podcast. Area Max, it's utility grade LED luminaire designed for residential street lighting, parking lots, security lighting, and area lighting applications. What's nice about this thing is that it has type five, type three, and dark sky friendly lens options on it. Surge protection better than anyone, 20 KV, 10 KA, and lightweight housing, easy toolless access, great fixture, replace anywhere up to a 250 watt HID with this thing. Check it out. Who the magicians down at Evluma coming in hot again with another great dark sky ready product. Go to evluma.com. That's right, Greg. Evluma.com. Check them out. Hello, listeners and darkness lovers. Welcome to another episode of Starving for Darkness. My name is Jane Slade, along here with my co-host, Michael Colligan. And we are so excited to bring on our next guest, Valerie Stimmick bailey is a travel, space, and astro-tourism writer. She founded Space Tourism Guide in 2017, and her first book, Dark Skies, A Practical Guide to Astro-Tourism, was published by Lonely Planet in 2019. You can also find her space stories in Forbes and How Stuff Works. Valerie, welcome to the show. We start every show with the same request. Will you please tell us about the first dark sky experience that comes to mind that made you feel a sense of awe, a sense of your own humanity and left you awestruck. Absolutely. First, thank you so much for having me. And um, like many people, my story started as a child. Uh, I actually grew up in Alaska, uh, which in itself is a great destination for a number of astro tourism experiences like seeing the Aurora. But when I was probably about 10 or 11 years old, my grandfather came to visit and he was a very traditional Italian man who had in his younger days wanted to be an astronaut himself, but didn't meet the physical requirements. As you, I'm sure you're aware, there were very specific physical requirements for the early astronauts and he was not that shape to be frank, but he went into meteorology. So he knew a ton about you know anything to do with the sky. And we were standing at the bus stop one day, he walked me to the bus stop and he points up at the sky and he says, do you see that star? that's not a star, that's the space shuttle. So it just so happened that he was aware enough of what was going on with shuttle missions and recognized the shuttle sort of in the morning light catching the sun, lighting up as there was a mission in space. And that that one may not be my very first dark sky experience, but it's the first one that made me realize that there was, it was much bigger than I ever realized. And still, whenever I see the International Space Station in the night sky, it's awe-inspiring to think about the fact that there are humans up there looking down, doing research, studying, watching what's going on. That that always gets me. Yes. Well, I would say that's evident in your work because you are the founder of Space Tourism Guide. What is this guide? Tell us a little bit about it. Absolutely. I So my background is in travel writing. So I usually say I'm a travel writer and then I mention the space and science and all the other topics that I've since become a writer in as well. And um, I became interested in space tourism, like many people, years ago when we were being promised that this year will be the year, it'll happen this year. And um, so in about 20, early 2017, I realized that if there was going to be a space tourism industry, there needed to not only be scientists talking about 
space tourism. There needed to be people who were interested from the other side. So if we call it space tourism, we needed tourism resources as well. So people who are willing to comment on the experience, comment on the implications of the tourism. You know, there's a lot of environmental concerns regarding uh, mainstream mm -hmm. space tourism and you know, the, the increased pace of rocket launches and things like that. Um, so I decided to start a website about space tourism, uh, thinking that oh, this will be the year that space tourism finally happens in 2017. And um, so I started building some resources about space tourism, but also resources about experiencing space on Earth. And so what you'll mostly find today is that is more of the latter. You'll find stargazing guides for a number of cities across the country. Here in the U.S., I've also just branched into Canada. You'll find aurora guides. So every single country where you can see the aurora, I have a guide on different destinations in that country. Eclipse guides. Every, every time we have an eclipse, I'm updating that guide. Um, I cover meteor showers observatories, even science museums, things like that, daytime, sort of daytime space experiences too. I cover all of that. And the idea is we need people to be interested in space science so that when they can go to space, they're still interested and they believe it's worth the investment and uh, the cost. And, you know, it's a valuable resource as a tourism um, product. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that it is something that is very mythical for most people here on earth. And especially, and we talk about this on the show, but there's such a disconnection from the night sky experience, not only because we can't see it, but also because we're always inside in this mediocre level of light, never experiencing pure darkness, um, even self-inflicted. So even if, if we could see the stars, people are not really in the habit of going and looking. So I think your your guide is very timely in terms of really trying to redirect people to a much more magnificent source of inspiration. So what are you seeing in this community that you're building? And do you have any anecdotes that you'd like to share? Absolutely. So what I find that I was very delighted and surprised by is that I, I have built a travel site. I still think of it as a tourism website but it's affected by totally different forces than most tourism. So the one that always gets me is I, especially in my earlier days, I could tell you without looking at the forecast when it was a cloudy weekend in Seattle, because people were not searching for stargazing resources in Seattle that weekend. I just had a, that much of a finger on the pulse of every single city. I could see the seasonal, but even just the day-to-day -day changes. Um, it's also very clear if there's a meteor shower where it's cloudy and where it's not based on which cities are getting a lot of searches. Um, so what I'm finding is people are very excited about stargazing near their cities. Um, it's if you, without getting too technical, people Google stargazing near me. That's actually mm -hmm. how they usually find my website. It's not that they, they Google stargazing near Seattle or stargazing near Houston or any whatever city they're in. It's that they want to know what's near where they are. And there are a lot of local resources in those cities typically that provide them, but they don't necessarily have the science background on top of it. So it's this magical blend of both. The other thing I see a lot of interest in is anytime there's an eclipse. So we just had a annular solar eclipse last week. Um, it was visible from here where I live in Cleveland. And so I had emailed my community um, the day that it happened actually, cause it was a morning eclipse. And I said, did anybody see it? And I get all these great stories back. I was here and I saw it and oh, it was cloudy here. We didn't see anything. I, I had one person who didn't read the original resource I had sent and said, I couldn't see it in San Francisco. And I was like, no, I'm sorry, you couldn't. But that wasn't your fault. That was because you live in a different part of the world and it wasn't visible. Um, so it's also a lot of education. There's a pretty wide range of uh, enthusiasts and, and almost uh, expert you know, enthusiasts all the way to people who are complete novices and don't even understand the orbital mechanics or anything like that. They're kind of blending uh, in this one community. Well, you say on your website, space should be accessible to everyone. There's an attitude that space is only accessible to the super rich. We do not believe this is true. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, the, this is a strong commentary of space tourism specifically that the ticket price is just prohibitively expensive for the everyday person, which absolutely it is. I don't think we can deny that $200,000 plus ticket for a 15 minute ride to space is it's not something that most people will ever be able to afford or justify, even if they could afford it. That said, I am a firm believer that there are forces in the tourism industry that will naturally make this more affordable, um, specifically in going to space. So I like to draw the analogy to Antarctica, 
when people first started traveling to Antarctica for pleasure, it was exceptionally expensive. It was at that time prohibitive to anyone but the ultra wealthy who thought themselves to be explorers. The, over time, the infrastructure in the, that part of tour, the tourism industry developed such that you can go to Antarctica for between five and ten thousand dollars, which, if that's a priority to you, is something you can save up for in a lifetime. I'm not thinking that anyone's going to be going to space once a year on vacation. That's not sort of the idea that I have, but I could see it being this bucket list thing where eventually prices come down to the point where that is an option. And I think that that price point is probably more in the fifty to seventy-five thousand dollar range. Which again, I know that sounds like a ton of money, but if it's a priority to you, it is possible to save that in a lifetime. It needs to be a priority throughout your life. It's not generally something you can just save up for a year or two. But that's what I mean. I also believe that there is a powerful experience to be had on Earth. So when we talk about going to space, the overview effect is always brought up as this psychological effect where people who look down on Earth and see the curvature of Earth and the thinness of our atmosphere get an appreciation for how precious our planet is and that it needs to be protected and cared for. I believe that there is another powerful psychological impact of seeing the Milky Way. Mm. It has not been studied. I am trying desperately to find the resources and grants or whatever there might be to start studying this um, because it's it's just something that's really hard to measure. But I think the first time you see the Milky Way or the first time you see it after a long time of not seeing it, it has a powerful impact on you to realize there is this is a very small little planet in a very far flung corner of a galaxy, which is not even the only galaxy. And we can see those other galaxies when we look up at the night sky. That humble, humbling um, smallness is a very powerful reminder that everything needs to be put in perspective. And certainly we have major problems we're facing on our planet. But if we remember that we're part of something so much bigger, but also that we can accomplish whatever we set our minds to, as we have throughout human history, it's the, I call it the Milky Way effect. I think the Milky Way effect is something and that that is accessible to everybody. We can... Uh, it is, it's a goal to, you know, have grants to send school groups out on stargazing events from the from cities where there's no night sky at all out into the part of the country where they live, where they can see the Milky Way. That's a life changing experience for those children, even if they don't go into the space sciences in any way. We talk about that all the time here on the show, Mike and I, and uh, this jumps right into your next point on your website, which is awe inspires action. When we stand in awe of the night sky, we are changed by this experience. Talk about awe when it comes to how you think it makes us better people. We say that on the show here all the time. Yeah, I, it's, it's funny that awe is one of those human emotions that's very hard to articulate. Um, I have a background in psychology, actually. That's my very, first, my very first life, if we think of me having nine lives. I was a, a <laughs> clinical psychologist, so I know a, a fair amount about this. And I, I find it's one of the emotions that's the hardest to explain because it doesn't, it's sort of a lizard brain emotion. It, it's, it's, hmm. You can hear I'm struggling to articulate. But what I find in myself and when I speak with friends and community members who have a first impactful experience is that when you're left speechless by the raw power of nature, in this case, the night sky and the Milky Way and the stars, you can never look at that thing the same way again. So it's the, it's the same as people who visit the national parks in the American West the first time, and you see these incredible formations carved over millions of years, and you get a sense that there's just so much more. And we are very small organisms with very short lifespans. And, you know, it's all relative. I mean, fruit flies have a very different perspective on that too. But when you can open your mind to those bigger timelines and bigger physical spaces, and then think, you know, this planet is pretty darn special. If that's if we somehow ended up at this exact moment with all the resources we need and to be where we are and, you know, we should probably take care of that. We should probably protect it. So that's that's sort of what I mean is when you have that experience, you, you can't help. I hope you can't help but realize that there's some really I mean, just that we are in this part of the galaxy where we're not due to collide with anything in the next few billion years. And we can see this incredible view of the night sky. Everything worked perfectly. The timing is great. There's there's a serendipity. Many people attribute that to spiritual or religious causes. And, and maybe I'm not an expert in that by any stretch, but I can, when I see the night sky, I can almost imagine why that makes, that gives people a lot of comfort that we got this perfect moment that we get to be on this planet. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you defined and redefined the term space tourism. 
So where was that definition and where did you nudge it to? I'm curious about your decision making there. Absolutely. So space tourism, I think, and to be fair, that that article is probably a very fluid piece. Uh, the definition of space tourism is, is quite fluid. I think sure. I now am a little more traditional that I think space tourism is going to space generally. Mm -hmm. um, at the time when I started Space Tourism Guide, I was thinking that, and I'm still a little bit on the fence about this, that space tourism is the parent of astrotourism and commercial space flight. So commercial space flight is people paying to go to space. So it can be anyone from someone paying to go to the ISS or a Virgin Galactic commercial flight or Blue Origin, you know, that we're hearing a lot in the headlines about. Um, I thought space tourism is kind of the parent term and astrotourism, which is stargazing, aurora tourism, eclipse chasing, and then commercial space flight, where all these sort of children of space tourism. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's more clear to the, the public to just say that space tourism is commercial space flight. And astrotourism is like this very close sibling. I don't know that there's the hierarchy I originally had in mind, but I mm -hmm. do want to encourage people to realize that when we say space tourism, we can also mean astrotourism. Yes. And that that is accessible to many people. You don't have to be saving $250,000 to go experience space. You can experience space right here on Earth, and it can be incredibly impactful. Yes, I think that's a, a, a recurring theme here as well, which is, you know, it's my dream that you could be on a rooftop in New York City. And because we're controlling the lights properly. And I was recently saying to myself, you know, if a light is not a, in if the light doesn't have controls, it's truly out of control. And that's what we are. We are out of control with our lighting. And I do believe that our lighting technology can support a view of the stars in the middle of New York City if we were to reconceptualize how we delivered light. So I feel like your definition, and, and I'm fine with it being loose, because I think we need to bring the space, the outer space, as close to humanity as possible. It's our shared heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, over ancestors, that we have all looked to this sky for inspiration and for escape. And so I love the idea that you're playing with the definition and that you're trying to give people more access to this experience and this type of thought. Yeah. It's <laughs> funny you say um, that it's our shared heritage and it dates back to our ancestors. I actually put on a specific t-shirt for our interview today. It's by um, an indigenous designer and it has a picture of an astronaut and then a night sky. And in the night sky are more traditional constellations. And what it reads is, we are the science fiction of our ancestors. And so it's this nice reminder that our ancestors used to look at the sky and dream of the future and we get to live it, which means that we, what we're dreaming of is possible too in, science, in a science fiction kind of way. We get to architect it. And yeah, yeah. I, gosh, light pollution. <laughs> I'm in a new city. I moved here about a month ago and I'm just getting to know the night sky. And it's like, well, I can see a couple of things. It's not too bad. <laughs> Which city is that? I'm in Cleveland. Oh, right. Cleveland. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you. You're, you're very excited about the future, which is nice, actually. That's um, refreshing because we often, you know, people that are into this topic can be very sort of despondent at times and somewhat resigned to uh, uh, their fate rather than pursuing a destiny that achieves certain things, right? But I'm interested in this definition between space tourism and astrotourism that you were mentioning and I was listening to you. And while I was listening, I was thinking about the people that have given reports about looking at the earth from orbit. And then the difference between those and people who experience say the Milky Way in a special way or something like that. And there's a difference to those two experiences to me. The first one uh, with the space tourism where someone is viewing Earth from outer space, there's almost like this sense of fragility and specialness that dawns upon them that they all seem to share. And that is unique to that experience. And I think with the astrotourism or the stargazing part of it, there's this spirit experience of feeling small and having a sense of awe that is unique to that experience. Am I correct in that idea? Do you, do, you, do you share that with me or do you have something to add to it or anything like that? I absolutely agree, yes. I think that, I think that a, the Milky Way effect, if we wanted to call mm -hmm. it that, which is sort of my colloquial term, um, you can guide a person having a Milky Way effect to have it have a similar outcome to the overview effect. So the overview effect seems to just organically inspire a sense of environmentalism is sort of the very 
derivative definition, um, that, that getting that sense of the fragility of our planet. You can someone looking at the Milky Way has a different perspective on the same reality, which is that we have this one planet that we are observing in space. They're the same in that way. They're the same. Um, so if you are at a star party or you're doing any sort of like this is why I think public outreach in, in astronomy is so important. You can guide people to have a similar takeaway, which is I have this incredibly humbling experience. I have this awe of the universe and the implicit in that awe is and the planet I live on is this very small, precious space that I, I need to care about. And that can start with protecting the night sky and dealing with light pollution in urban areas and things like that. And when when you're when you're discussing these the we often go into this idea of the night sky is a valuable resource. So astrotourism presents it by definition that way. That you know if we preserve this and we give people access to it, they'll be willing to pay for it. Um, and in a way, in a sense, like that cheapens it. In a way, there's a sense in which that cheapens the idea. Well, what people are going to pay for access to the stars. But in another way, these things have value by definition of what people are willing to pay for it. So if you look at the space flight, you know, Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic or, you know, I think I think Bezos is going to be taking a trip in the next month or two or something I heard in July. Um, but, I mean, you, they're $250,000. But, like, that tells you that people want to experience this. Um, how do we give, how do we send that message out there? Because there's part of this awareness creation that needs to send people a message that these experiences are incredibly valuable to you. I mean, there's places in Costa Rica where you can fly to and pay money and this and that to do ayahuasca in the middle of the jungle and people pay $5,000, $10,000 for these experiences or what have you. And I find that the experience with psychedelic drugs, ayahuasca, psilocybin, these things sound very familiar to people who have these stargazing experiences, actually. And that the long-term effect of that is the same and that it, it, it gives you a sense of humil humility. There's an ego death that is, people are all often describing. How can we imbue this even more? I know you're doing, good, doing great work. You're doing a great job, by the way. But is there another level to this that we can really take this situation and add economic value to uh, a starry night. Interesting idea. I'm going to be a little bit, you know, brainstorming and speaking on the fly sure. as I haven't thought through this a ton. I think the initial phase that I would propose if I were in charge of it all is to present the night sky like we present our national parks in the US, which is you pay for access and the access is not, you're not actually paying for access. You're paying to protect the resource for the next person who wants to access it. And it, I don't know that the national park ever really positions it that way, but it's just this sort of agreement we've all come to that we pay for national park access because we value those national natural resources hmm. and we want them to be available if we or someone else we love or care about or anybody else wants to go to a park in the future. So that's phase one. I think that the other way to present the night sky and this is where it gets tricky. Like I was saying, we don't have a ton of research on the effect of the night sky. It'd be great. You know, we can look at psychedelic drugs and measure. I mean, there's a mainstream authors writing incredible books. You know, my husband is interested in this topic. We have these books at home. He talks to me about them. We don't present the night sky as something you go and consume for the outcome it produces. Yes. And so I think that that's an opportunity. Um, I actually, it's funny, I'm in the middle of a negotiation with a property, an island property near the equator. I won't say specifically where, as we're still negotiating on doing um, stargazing retreats. So mm. we're actually positioning mm -hmm. the night sky as a wellness experience, that going and experiencing it is something that adds to the wellness in your life. When you present it that way, people will pay for it. It's like you have to create this understanding that like I'm paying to receive a, a value back. So you first, I'd say you position is like, I'm paying to protect it so that when I want to consume it, it's available. Sure. And then the next is I'm paying to receive an actual benefit in my life. And we need to figure out how to measure that benefit so we can actually position it for people. So they understand, you know, if I do a wellness retreat, I come home and I'm calmer and I'm happier and I don't get stressed out by, you know, the cat throwing up, which <laughs> happened this morning, uh, you know, because I'm like in perspective, a cat throwing up is just a, it's part of life. Like, it's not a big thing to be worried about. <laughs> Because I've just spent five days looking at the night sky and realized I'm a very small person in this great big universe. So that would be the two kind of the two phases I work at. It's just protection first, 
in creating that agreement with the public that we we pay for access to protect it so the next time we want to go I, and then i'm sorry you we, go on keep going I just, <laughs> you're, jane you're and i are arguing about who's going to talk next here uh, i'm just going to make one point like, one yeah. point it then literally like it consumption. literally grounds you period yeah. like viewing yeah. the night sky is a grounding experience it puts you in your place that's why it it humbles and awes you i think of the pole focus when you watch a movie and it's like you are watching the universe open up above you and you realize like that part of that is the you pulling back and realizing how much is up there mm. well speaking of protection i was uh i watched a webinar i think it was given by the Scottish Astronomical Association this week and it was talking about the satellite war that is happening across the planet which is very politically driven I already see you rolling your eyes Valerie and I really want to pick your brain about what you think about SpaceX and all of the other satellite orgs that are trying to really race them what their way up there with sometimes very cheap materials that leads to garbage and streaks in the sky if you're an astrophotographer so I would love to dig into your thoughts because this really seems very counter to astrotourism. So what, are you, what do you think about what's happening? Yeah, I rolled my eyes because I don't think we can win this conversation. There's no, um, there's no way to, to win it, um, unfortunately, because um, the, there's a lot of things I, you know, if I, I sort of was like, if I was in charge before, like I'm still in charge and I'm making decisions. Um, if I had my way, Everybody who puts something in space must have a way to mitigate the effect of that thing being in space. If it becomes depreciated, you are responsible as the launching provider or the company that built it for having a depreciation plan that can be implemented to bring that thing down or to, I don't know, jettison it. We're not supposed to jettison things. So I'm not sure that's the right solution. But um, I think what the issue is, is that we generally as humans have a very short term view on everything. And so we've put a bunch of stuff up into space and now that stuff is in the way of other stuff that we wanna put into space that provides more value than the stuff that's already there. And nobody seems to have a plan for bringing any of it back down. Um, why I think we can't win the conversation is it's not, it's not that these private companies are launching satellites for no purpose. We have a ton of benefit from most of the things that are in space as, as just the public. There's lots of private satellites and governmental satellites and things that we don't even see the imp impact of. But you know, when we look at SpaceX and Starlink, the goal is to provide internet to the world, to places that don't have strong internet. Like that's an incredible value to humanity to be able to launch in places that don't currently have the infrastructure to bring, I mean, they always say, you know, the continent of Africa, to bring Africa up to a higher speed where you can get more entrepreneurs and workers online. And you can, these people who just need that infrastructure to be able to join a next level of a workforce and global economy, that's a huge benefit. And that's something I think we want to have available. But I should say no Starlink satellite that goes up should be allowed to just float around there once it's not operating anymore. If it, if it stops working, if it stops functioning, if it's not serving the, the value that it was launched to provide, there should be a way to that the company has dis decided to bring it back down or to disassemble it, you know, something like that. There has to be something. Um, from the perspective of, of astronomers and astrophotographers, who are being negatively affected by this? I don't, I don't see any way to solve that. Um, I think that's a, a cost-benefit analysis we have to take. And the difficulty we're facing right now is that with private launch providers, when let me back up, when the governments were in control, you had to get permission to launch things. When meant someone, a third party, would say we determine that the value of the thing you're putting up is worth the cost. So we've determined that mm -hmm. Starlink internet is worth the fact that observers in these five major astronomy locations are going to have bad nights, five nights a month or whatever the math would be that they've determined. When a private company can launch, there is no third party check. There is nobody but the company saying the cost is worth the value or the benefit we're going to get out of it. And it's difficult when it's the company is not only the company launch, it's not just a private company launching someone else's satellite like Rocket Lab, it's SpaceX's building the satellites and launching them themselves. And there's no one in there saying, guys, what about the guys down in Chile who now can't photograph the night sky? And their job is to look for giant asteroids. How about that? Like, that's a benefit we need to keep around. So I don't know that, I mean, I'm not obviously advocating for more governmental um, oversight, especially as I don't know that any one government in the world is necessarily qualified to be making those decisions when there's benefits, when the benefits are global, it seems like it should be a global conversation. 
But then, okay, let's talk about how do we build a global coalition of people who are protecting the night sky while simultaneously utilizing it in an efficient way and, and you know, pr having it provide value back to those of us on Earth. We can find a balance. It's just we're not there yet. So first off, I'm extremely suspicious, okay, of corporate uh, <laughs> platitudes about people in Africa, okay? I, I don't mean to be, I, I think, you know, I wish Africans all the best, but I'm not sure that at the heart of SpaceX or Blue Origin or any of these companies is a real deep desire to bring internet to the Africans, unless they're able to pay for it, say, you know, sure. um, or their governments want to pay for it. So, I, I, you know, this idea, that sounds like publicity to me or, or marketing. Um, hey, Ferdinand. For the listeners, uh, the cat just jumped in the screen here. So I'm very suspicious of those kind of things. And I get in trouble for saying that because a lot of people like platitudes and they're, they're kind of tricked by platitudes. They feel good. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you look at this, what you're talking about is really a new theater of war. And so when we have a theater of war, whether that's a commercial war or it's war between nation states and what's happening in space right now is probably both some combination of those two things. And it's not hot. They're not shooting each other's satellites down yet. But certainly the technology is being created to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we know for sure that the Chinese have, have, have been developing technology to destroy American satellites. Americans have probably had this since the 1980s. So th you're talking about a theater of war. Wherever there's a theater of war, there's massive collateral, collateral damage that's not considered at the time when you're doing whatever you're doing. And that's just the nature of the fog of war. Um, how do we prevent space? Like space is becoming a war zone. How do, we, how do we change that? How do we change that conversation? I have no idea how to do that. Very powerful people are in charge of that, that, that arena, so to, so to speak, right now. But, you know, how do we, uh, is there any, anything we can do? I know you said it's tough, but is there anything we can do? Like, do you really want the Chinese government in charge of space? Do you want the U.S. government in charge of space? Do you want the U.N. in charge of space? I mean, I don't really think any of those options is all that good, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah. we've seen in the last year how these international organizations can be infiltrated with the, um, with the priorities of one particular nation state or the other. Yeah. And so how do we get around this as, as a species I think everybody needs to see the Milky Way to start off. But I mean, I, I, you know, there's such a, it's, it's, it's an, it seems like that's, we're setting up another tragedy of the commons for ourselves to figure out how we're going to fix this. We got plastic in the ocean. Now we got a sky full of satellites up there that are smashing into one another and they're shooting each other down or whatever. It seems like it, now I'm, now I'm despondent again. Now I'm depressed again. How do we get out of this? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. If anyone's just listening and not able to see you, we didn't see all my expressions as you yeah. let off different potential leaders of this. Um, well, first of all, uh, there's a lot. there was a lot to unpack there. Uh, I think you definitely said what I consider to be the first solution, which is people need to see the night sky. They need to see the night sky and realize that it's a valuable resource. That's it. Because if they do that, theoretically, and not, this is not the case in every country, because not every country is a democracy where the people's will is taken into account in the governing of that country. If everyone saw and valued the night sky, then we theoretically can affect policy at governmental levels to say, you know, in our country, the night sky is a valuable resource and we make policy decisions and we approve or don't approve government um, sanctioned flights or launches based on that. Okay. And that could be a lot of countries could do that if people in those countries felt that that was a priority. So having people experience the night sky is pivotal. But you brought up the tragedy of the commons. And I think what we know from economics and the way that people behave in that sort of situation is you can't prevent it. It is a sort of a part of human nature um, that if no one person or no one group is responsible for a resource and enforces behavior within that resource, there will be a tragedy of the commons that has to then be corrected. So, OK, that's where we are. We're moving into the tragedy of the commons. Do, do we have the foresight to start planning now for how to correct it? So to me, I think, and it's interesting because, you know, we've moved into space in the U.S. where there are enough private launch providers now that the government, I don't, I don't think they're moving fast enough to say, like, we, you, the FAA has to approve launches, but like, that, that's like one, it feels to me, to me, that feels like one small sort of gate 
to prevent people from launching things that haven't done a due diligence of the long-term implications of whatever they're launching. I mean, so, and then you look at China or Russia and there is nobody but the government launching. So what the government decides is a priority is what's getting launched. And that is irrelevant to what the people want or what the globe needs. Um, when you have players with those kinds of different priorities, I think you're always going to have some conflict, and, but that's playing out on every stage, basically every stage of policy between the US and Russia and China. So it's definitely not unique to space. However, I think if you could get Chinese citizens to take an active interest in protecting the night sky, the way they protect national parks in their country and their um, incredible cultural heritage that they have there, you could potentially see a longer term, a shift in the longer term toward it also being a priority for China to play the same by the same set of rules, which is the night sky is important and needs to be protected as both a physical space and a resource to consume from here on Earth. When I think about it, it looks to me like a lot of this, you know, you look historically at human behavior and I'm not a psychologist. I sell light bulbs every day. Um, but when I look at these things like, you know, war and especially the 20th century, but even before that, you know, the, the, um, the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, discovery of America by Europeans and, and what happened after that, there's like a hysteria going on. It's like, a you know, take everything you can for the sake that you can take it. And like, that seems like a, a theme in human history, like this, you know, whenever these governments become so powerful, they just seem to want to expand into any arena they can. And it's like a, it's like a, a growing monster of a human, I don't know, institutional decay or something. I don't know what it is, but it seems to like grow on its own. And there's, it has its own momentum and it's governed by a hysteria to take stuff or to own stuff or, and I, you know, look, I'm a private property person. I'm not, a, you know, I, 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 you know, fall typically in the center of the political spectrum, but I mean, you look at it, the, there's like a hysteria behind this. Let's get this space. Let's put as much stuff up there as possible as soon as we can. And it's all to give a, well, dude, we're just doing it for the Africans. That's the only reason, you know, and they come up with these platitudes that make everybody feel better. It's not about the Africans. It's got nothing to do with Africa unless they got money, you know? So, I don't know. I ha there's, a, there's like a hysteria behind all this that it scares me in a way. In, an interesting counterpoint, I would say, is New Zealand. Uh, as a global player, New Zealand is doing pretty much everything right um, in that pers from the perspective of space. And they are a space launching country. They have incredible resources and, and governmental support for dark sky protection. I mean, they're, they were trying to be the first dark sky nation, and they're still in the process of working on that. Um, they seem to be a country that has decided to think on a different time frame about the resources available. But I would say, when I say that, you know, the part of the reason that different countries behave differently is the resources available to them. This is like Maslow's hierarchy of needs types of things. If your country um, doesn't feel secure on the global stage to not be constantly needing to consume whatever resources are available and important that maybe other players on the board are saying are important, right? So China, China plays on a different time frame than every country, which is why their policies don't necessarily make sense. And then you end up seeing them right now where they're gaining a ton of power and everyone's sort of acknowledging it. But space is really only the the obsession of China because Russia and the US have been sort of duking it out, but admittedly it's been politely duking it out over the last 70 years. Um, China obviously realized, well, if the two biggest players in the board think that this is important, we also need to make this a huge priority. And that has inspired countries like India and Brazil and other countries to, to play the same game. But with New Zealand, they're I think partially from being a small island nation that's sort of had to do it on their own all this time, it's quite a far place from everywhere. Um, they don't necessarily feel the need to compete on the same scale and the same uh, mm -hmm. factors as other countries. And so they have taken a very different perspective. So, I mean, ideally everyone would be New Zealand. We'd feel, we'd know we, we'd know we have enough that we can collectively, this is where I get sort of hopeful instead of despondent, we can collectively solve any problem if we set our minds to it. As human, we're the, the most intelligent species we've ever encountered, right? Like there's nobody better place to try and solve the problems that we have than this, this species that we are. If we just all thought of it that way, which maybe listeners and viewers will think I'm just being a little bit naive about this, but I don't, I think that that's a choice. 
obviously I understand for humanity, there are major concerns and people who can't think this way because they're simply trying to make sure that they have enough to eat and they have a safe place to live and their health is cared for. And the, but okay, we can solve all those problems too. Those are actually the easiest ones to solve. We know how to grow food and manage water and um, provide housing. We just have to choose to make them all. Priority. And reduce light pollution. Yes. And reduce light pollution, which is another resource that, but people don't even get to thinking about that resource because they're too busy worrying about, you know, am I safe? If you can't feel that you're safe, if your, your government doesn't provide you that safety and your society doesn't provide you that safety, the next levels of resources that are going to provide you well-being are not even on your road, your mind. They're not, you can't even worry about them because you're worrying about the primal needs that you have. And there are people at individuals there are communities, there are countries, all at every level, There's there are examples of that. And I think that's what you see when you see the kind of aggressive resource grabbing or resource consumption. And unfortunately, right now, that's put us in a terrible environmental position too, because we're all doing the same thing with um, fossil fuel, fuel consumption. I think it's really interesting what you bring up about this sense of competition, because it's actually, it might be the, our downfall, our competition. Because here, New Zealand's not really competing. They're just doing it out of their own curiosity and desire. And uh, yet all the other countries that are playing in this field, like Russia, the US and, and China, it's such a competition to get up there and to get up there with more quantity and to take more control. And then, you know, when you look at the graphic of what the, the Earth would look like surrounded in satellites, I mean, we're, we're like actually blocking off communication from potentially other life forms. Um, we're blocking off the visibility of the night sky. And it's the same story with light pollution, where you have this race to be brighter that is also making us dumber and uh, less aware and we're cutting off our senses within the darkness. So it's this competition and this competitive spirit that's actually making us lose our bearings. So it's interesting. And I, I don't know if anyone has any final points on this, but I do agree we were, the three of us unfortunately are not gonna solve this problem today in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I would we say that try. New Zealand is a small nation that uh, smaller population wise in the greater Toronto area and is very far from Australia, never mind anywhere else. New Zealand is very far from Australia and it also kind of exists under tacit US protection. And so those three things together kind of allow them to, you know, carve out, they're small, they're in the middle of nowhere and they're protected by the United States Pacific fleet or five, how many, how many fleets of aircraft carriers they have out there. But, you know, they're kind of protected. And so they're able to make that choice, which I think is a wise choice. But I'm very, I'm always suspicious of far off nations that are culturally homogeneous, you know, largely, you know, and very small setting examples. I mean, America and Can Canada is a massive nation compared to even New Zealand, never mind United States or Canada. I mean, United States or China. But, you know, I, I, you're right. I don't think we're going to solve the issue. But I do think that the light pollution issue can be solved. And even if we do see some satellites, and even if, you know, they're cutting across your Milky Way, kids think satellites are kind of cool, actually. I had some kids up at the cottage a couple weekends ago, and we had a beautiful night sky where we could see many, many stars. And they saw a couple satellites and shooting stars. And like, what's that? That's a satellite. That's a shooting star. And, and they really enjoyed it. So I don't think it prevents us from accessing the night sky, although it is... It will pollute it for some photographers, I suppose. But <laughs> the point that I learned in the webinar that was this was that as of now, it's OK. It's we can deal with it as astronomers. But the trajectory is what they're mm. worried about. Sure. And um, interesting point about New Zealand. New Zealanders always um, complain because they always are like, they forgot to put it on the map. It often gets, it's so out on its own that it's often left off maps by cartographers. Yeah. Um, now, yes. You can see me looking up. I actually have a map right above my desk. <laughs> and so I'm like looking at, I'm like looking at the different players as I'm talking about them. Like, oh yeah, New Zealand is, it's far, it's far. They almost get to be on their own game board because they are protected slash isolated. Um, but you know, that doesn't mean we can't learn some lessons about how we approach these issues from a policy perspective. 
I want to switch gears here because I uh, have an obsession with the natural daylight cycle and its, its powers of medicine at all points. And you grew up in Alaska. So I want to hear about what it is like to be in Alaska um, with the odd natural daylight cycle that you experience as per the norm that most people receive on Earth. Um, and then I want to, my sub question to that is how do you think this impacted you in terms of what you ended up doing with your career and working with the night sky? Yeah, I can answer the first question or the second question first, because I think that there were a lot of um, like undercurrents of astronomy when I was growing up. I was obviously interested in it. I mean, I had one of those bedspreads as a kid that was clouds during the daytime. And when you turn off the lights, there were constellations on it. Um, mm -hmm. I was definitely interested in it, but I also grew up in a place that I didn't realize like I had got to experience the night sky far more than most people do in the winter because it was dark for longer and there was the aurora. And I remember seeing hail bop and I um, saw the space shuttle. So I had all these hail different- Hail bop? Hail bop, the comet hail bop. Oh, I don't know about the comet hail bop. Oh yeah, it was, uh, I mean, I yeah, it's definitely 1997, April 1997. Um, it was a, a two citizen astronomers, I believe, who discovered it. And it was visible um, in April 1997 was when it reached uh, perihelion. And it was just uh, one of the best first um, comets that people were able to see when photographers and cameras were really starting to improve. It's mm. fascinating. Um, Anyway, I saw that as a kid. I remember looking through a telescope and looking out at this comet and realizing there's a comet and there's a tail and the tail's like all these miles long, all the, these perspective challenger things. Um, in terms of the daylight, I have a, I am very highly attuned to changes in daylight now as an adult from having spent my childhood in a place where it was dramatic change. I um, Right now it's lovely because we're obviously in the Northern Hemisphere, we're at the longest days of the year and we can soak it all in. Um, in Alaska right now, there, there are parts that are not having any sunset or sunrise. They're fully in full daytime right now, which is lovely. And, uh, there are parts like where I grew up where they're getting dusk. They're not, the sun's dropping below the horizon, but it's not ever crossing out of the, the twilight, um, phases. And that in the summer, it was great. Um, days were long, you know, it sounds like the idyllic kid summer memory like long summer days and it was warm and sunny um in the winter it's the opposite so i distinctly remember going to school in the dark coming home in the dark basically never seeing the sun especially when it's cold in the winter and like the, it can get cold enough though it didn't often where kids don't even go out for recess during the day so in or in high school you don't have recess anymore if you don't leave the building you don't see the sun and i remember um as i got to be an older teenager and i would go um you know drive for lunch or whatever because i was able to drive i'd see in the town where I lived, I lived in a valley. And so there's this one point where the valley, there's like a, there's like two mountains and they create sort of visual dip. And the sun would cross that at the, at the darkest days of the year. And you get about 10 minutes of daylight, like 10 minutes of sun that you could see with your eyes. And I remember thinking, this is my daily dose. It's literally a medicinal dose of UV that is going to help my body create vitamin D and have all the physiological responses I need. So I need to not put on sunglasses and kind of not look at the sun, but like let it on my face and just soak up the sun. And I think of that a lot for, for me personally, I, the sun is an energy source and I let it so soak into me. I obviously, I sunburn very easily. So I try and be very careful about sun consumption from that perspective. But to, even today I went for a run and it's quite a, kind of a chilly morning and I got out in that sun and that sun started to warm my skin. And I was like, oh, that, that solar energy, like power me up. I need it today. I need that energy and it's there and it's available at all times. Um, I'm very attuned to getting, getting my sunlight every day. There's a reason because... they call it sunbathing, right? Mm -hmm. I, it's interesting how, um, you know, you get people, people don't think about light correctly. Um, in a way, I do another podcast on the lighting industry called Get a Grip on Lighting, and we interview many scientists, and it almost seems like with respect to light and science, we're like fish figuring out we're in water and how, what light is and how important it is to us on a daily basis. And there's some things that are kind of emerging on this podcast that I've been wondering for a long time. So one of those things was like, let's bring, you know, sunlight indoors with human centric lighting. And I thought to myself, well, are, are people going to get sunburned? Are they going to, they need to wear sunglasses inside now. And then I realized that a lot of the, that we're, I was told by one of the doctors on this show and one of my suspicions was confirmed is that 
you know, sunglasses are largely bad for you in some instances. And you know, people do have damage to the retinal, retinals and retinas and should wear sunglasses. But this automatic reflux that everyone should wear sunglasses because the sun is bad for your eyes is actually quite damaging to people who live in northern hemispheres. It's very bad for them to do that. And, you know, the other thing is the increasing amount of um, chemicals in sunscreen to the point where you have SPF 60 and SPF 100. Most people don't realize that expired sunscreen is hazardous waste hmm. in Ontario. It has to be moved on manifest and it has to be treated at a hazardous waste chemical what, processing factory, right? Because of the chemicals in it. So... I think that our relationship to light and the sun, there's been a lot of marketing that's been presented as science. And I, I think the 20th century is the century of the mix up between marketing and science. And I hope that the 21st century, or and you can throw politics in there too, and you know, whatever, political science and science are two different kinds of science in case anybody was wondering. And often when people are talking about science, they're talking about the political variety, but um, yeah, I, I, and it's interesting that people from Alaska, like you're getting that little dose of sun and it's just a relief and you, you're so attuned to this. You go for a run, even though you're prone to sunburns because you're quite fair, but that you feel the sun interacting with you. And I think a lot of people have lost their senses with, to the darkness, to the sunlight, and they're shielding their eyes and they're looking at phones and they're not seeing the stars. I think there's a lot of things going on that, that this darkness movement that, you know, Jane and I are working on could really help people with their mental health and with their grounding and with who they are in the universe. And I don't know, I'm just blabbing on, but I just hear that in that message. And I'm concerned for people that there's been so many lies told to them that they, how do you, can we even recover without going crazy? There's so many lies, you know, about things. And I, how do we get over it? It's, it's, uh, it's traumatic. And I think people, as the truth comes out with the darkness movement in these other areas, like that the lighting industry is going to provide darkness to people. Like that's a paradigm shift. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to not provide light. We're going to provide darkness. These types of shifts, people are going to feel very betrayed by their institutions and the industries and, you know, these types of things. And I think there's going to be a la uh, a real um, snapping back of, the general person out there when they find out that sunglasses are bad for them, like when that gets out, I mean, how do people deal with that? I mean, anyway, mm -hmm. I'm just I'm blabbing on, but it just seems so mind blowing to me that for yeah. 40 years, people, you know, you, you know, you, 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 you've caused yourself a deficit when you thought you were helping yourself. Right. Cause you're, yeah, your eyes are not, um, strong in changing light anymore. Yeah. Um, I, what I would say, the one that I, the one that I am always surprised isn't positioned more, at least not from a more of a consumer of the communication about light pollution and um, uh, responsible lighting is that light at night, this is so this is mind boggling. And I've been sort of di like diving into this with my own psychology. Um, you sleep poorly. And if you sleep poorly, literally every part of your life is going to be miserable. <laughs> like, that's it. it. You sleep poorly. And what I was thinking is, you know, I, I think the problem is as humans, we don't remember being tired. Like if you think back in your history, it's mm. really hard to remember being tired, which I also think is why people get hangovers repeatedly because they forget how bad a hangover feels, right? We don't have a, we don't, there's something psychologically that protects us from some of these naturally unpleasant sensations in our lives. Pain, we know that because women, especially with childbirth, have totally different reflections on pain as time goes on from their childbirth, um, uh, fatigue to so sleep. And then I think the hangover is the mix of the two pain and fatigue. Uh, we just don't remember them. And so we forget that like every day we're tired, that, that the, the day we wake up that day tired, and we forget that we were so tired the day before, but when there's a simple solution generally, which is making sure it's dark enough that you can get restful sleep. And I don't see that, to me, that's a positioning opportunity from, from a marketing standpoint, because at the end of the day, you have to, science still needs to be presented in a package people want to consume, which is where marketing can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, it's just saying, you know, you're tired all the time. You know, you're tired is because there's light outside your window and you're not, you're not going to sleep restfully and your body's not cycling properly. And you can solve that. You know, that's not to say your kids aren't still going to wake you up too early and you're still going to need your cup of coffee and you're still, there's, you're, phys, you're working out or you're doing a physically demanding job. Oh, of course, you're going to have fatigue from all those things too. But there's like this really simple solution for one part of our 
general exhaustion that we're facing and it's just making sure it's dark enough like i in the last year i've started wearing an eye mask and the quality of my sleep is totally transformed and i thought i could sleep with anything because i grew up in alaska where it's light half the year so you learn to sleep when it's light out or you put you know covers over hang blankets over your window shades to give you an extra layer of protection from the the light but i just don't see i never i never see that that's not the messaging i'm receiving and that to me again like we were talking about packaging wellness and, and being a consumer of a, of a resource to get a, a wellness benefit. The wellness movement is so ridiculously huge and whole parts of that are also not exactly above board or reputable. Lots of great podcasts on that. Um, but it's also something people will pay for and they'll consume and they'll support if they think it's going to provide them that benefit. So if we've got people who are buying into wellness and we can position the, the dark sky movement as part of the wellness industry, that's a great way to piggyback and like let the science be presented in a way that people want to consume it and support it, and which is also accurate to the science. It's not a manipulation of the facts. It's absolutely not a manipulation. And, you know, with what we're talking about, I think we have, we're coming through an age of misinformation in which we are seeing the internet um, elevate great thought and also amplify a lot of really bad thought. And, and we are mired right now in between those two worlds. And, um, you know, Valerie, I took a look, look at your website. It's beautifully designed and articulated. And, you know, you're a fantastic writer. And, you know, trying to, to get out of the doldrums here and, and, and get back to the skip in our step where we started the show, you know, what I want to say is that the truth does prevail. And as as writers, I often find that my craft isn't even writing. It's actually in honing the truth in trying to select and order the words in a way that most encapsulates what I feel is the highest truth. It's a very tall order. And I see that in your work, Valerie. And I think that one of the things that the night sky presents is a vantage, is a space. Because to be a good writer, to be able to find those those words and to articulate them, you actually have to, it's a dedication of space to be able to have that vantage upon the waterfall of thought that we all experience every day, to be able to select and then order these concepts and i feel like the night sky is actually going to be the elevator of our writing of our truth of debunking the whole issue with chemical uh sunblock and sunglasses and that the public will start to understand as this truth starts to debunk other ways of being. So it's a slow game, unfortunately. I think the night sky, it's right back to where we started. I think it's a major tool to be able to find this truth and to elevate it to a better place. So that's my diatribe on the matter. And um, so what is in the future for you, <laughs> Valerie, in terms of um, what are some future projects that you're excited about in, in your work? Yeah, great question. Um, so I was just talking with my husband this morning. So my book with Lonely Planet came out uh, almost two years ago. There is a section on space tourism in it, which is uh, the sort of like last step of space tourism before it actually starts happening. And so as we look at um, Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin flying this summer and Virgin Galactic either right before or right after, depending on who you read, um, the book is going to be outdated. So I am hopeful that I can go back to Lonely Planet and do a minor update to make sure that we're as close to accurate as possible. Um, the other big thing that I've been working on, and it was unfortunately disrupted by the pandemic, like so many parts of the tourism industry, is to start leading tours in destinations that I believe have an, an especially uh, valuable night sky experience. So the very first one that I can confirm, um, I'm leading a tour in Jordan, the country of Jordan in the Middle East. Um, and I chose that destination specifically. I've been there. I have seen the night sky there. It is fabulous in part because there are major portions of the country that are undeveloped desert, which as we know from the American Southwest is a great condition for night sky viewing. And I find Jordan to be this lovely opportunity 
to teach people about the night sky, challenge their views about um, astronomy. So if they're an astronomy buff, most people don't realize how much of astronomy was informed by the Arabic astronomers. In fact, we would have lost astronomy as a Western science if not for the Arabic astronomers. People don't give them enough credit. But during the daytime, also challenge and uh, encourage growth in cultural interactions. So, oh my gosh, the Middle East, it's a terrifying place. It's right next to Israel. It's right next to Iraq. It's right next to Syria. I mean, this, this country, this tiny country has some very high profile neighbors. That's the nicest way to say it. And yet it is one of the most welcoming places you will ever go with people who every single person is basically an ambassador. And you'll find that in many countries. Obviously, there are many countries where that can be said. Um, but for especially North Americans, in the last 20 years, we have a very particular lens through which we view the Middle East. And I like to, to challenge people when they travel. I mean, that's why I travel. I travel to grow and develop. And so my Jordan trip, it's happening in March of 2022. And it's this perfect opportunity. If you, if you are interested in astronomy, we're gonna have events pretty much every night. And I'm hoping to have a speaker from the local astronomy society come talk. And I've been dive, diving deep into these huge old texts about Arabic astronomy to have my best knowledge for that. Um, and then some just gr great stargazing, fantastic, you know, bucket list, bucket list destinations in Jordan. Petra is the big one. You know, go see Petra, go live your Indiana Jones moment all in one trip. <laughs> it's this one little trip. And so it was supposed to be in March of 2020, obviously got canceled. Didn't happen this year, of course, because we were still not at a position in the pandemic where that would have been a responsible choice. But hopefully by March of next year, we'll be taking a small group there and just giving them a world-class immersive experience that they then go home and tell others about, even if not to go back to Jordan, but just to say, look, they, they got to go travel and see the night sky in other places and learn more about that. Um, the different heritages of the night sky. I'm, I'm huge. Another project of love, if you, if anyone listening or viewing is involved in publishing is I would love to write a book that captures as many of the indigenous and original mythologies of the night sky as possible. So all these stories that were used to make sense of the night sky by all of these different cultures, they are, in some of them, they're just getting lost. We're losing them because they're either oral or there aren't very good original sources anymore, or the secondary sources are not, they're from the 1920s, 30s, 40s. We don't have anything modern. Those, I would love to have a book that just let me like, I want to write it, but like that I could dive in and understand how the night sky means different things to different people, but somehow also still has this overarching meaning to everyone. Yeah, there's a real need to document the ancestry of the night sky. I completely agree with you. And uh, we're coming up on an hour for listeners who want to follow Valerie. She's at Instagram and Twitter at at vstimic, V-S-T-I-M-A-C. And then you can also visit her website, which is spacetourismguide.com. Mike, do you have any final comments for Valerie? No, I just really appreciate it. And I agree with you, especially some of those um, uh, islanders in the Pacific and their tales about traveling using the stars and, and what they call dead reckoning at night and stuff like that. I mean, that, that cannot be lost. How they got to Easter Island and, you know, across the entire Pacific Ocean using the stars. I mean, that's actually unbelievable when you think Gives about it. Gives me goosebumps it. every time. Yeah. <laughs> I just say thank you for being you and all your hard work and um, your intellectual span goes all over the place and it's just wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. You starved, now you're sated. That's right. I was starving for darkness with host Jane Slade and myself, co-host Michael Colligan. But before we go, we got to tell you about a little magic that we discovered in the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, and I'm talking about Evluma, coming out with a massive, awesome, crazy, mag magical LED dark sky ready luminaire for the outside, Greg. A E V L U M A dot com, the magicians. That's right. And in addition to what we talked about at the beginning, they have a photo control fail safe built into the fixture. Come on. And that actually. Yeah, that, that replaces the need to have to worry about a photo cell down the road. I love so if your that, photo man. cell burns out. It learns what it needs to do so that it continues to operate as though the photo cell is still working. That's why they're ma it's and magical, then, brother. It's magic. magic. And then on top of that, they have the Connect LED that is a wireless lighting management system. Use your phone, control that thing, get fancy. Oh, man. Evluma is so hot with these products, man. I just love it. Go to EVLUMA.com. That's Evluma.com. Proud Dell member, National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Yeah, baby. Come and get it. Bye for now.